Well, hello to all of you, wherever and with whomever you find yourself as the church today. It's long been stated at Sindel Baptist Church that the church has never been the building. It's always been the people. So although church looks a little different today, a lot remains the same because of you. I'm glad that you're watching this with your life group or in a little house church, whether you're with people or on your own, whether it's morning or afternoon or evening, that you've chosen to link in with others in this time. This message will be similar to much of what would normally be given on a Sunday in our normal services. But at the end, I'm going to finish by giving you a little prayer that you might like to pray, as well as a reflection question, which you might like to discuss or share about with people around you or even online. So with all that being said, let's get underway. Today, throughout all of the Sindel House Church gatherings, we're starting a brand new series called Moment to Movement. And that's because the narrative of our lives and of history are made up of moments that lead to movements, either internally or externally with public or personal responses. Moments, we all have them, lead to movements. Moments which change the course of our own lives, sometimes for the better, sometimes for worse, depending on how we choose to respond. In my studies at Bible College this year, one of the activities that we've done is to create kind of a, a personal timeline that compiles significant moments in our lives. Some of the things that have made their way into my own timeline include experiences that are both positive and negative. Significant moments like the day that I became a brother, the breakdown of my parents' marriage, the fight that I got into at school and the subsequent suspension as a result, the tragic death of a family member, the evening that I made a decision to follow Jesus for myself, the day that I married Zoe, as well as the day that my daughter Nora was born. Those are just some of the moments in my life which have led to significant movement as a result of their influence and effect, both positive and negative, depending on how I choose to respond to them. But moments also change history. As, moment, as movement in the lives of individuals lead to movements of people that impact and influence the world. Let me give you an example. In the early 1700s, one of the oldest Christian communities in Europe, the Moravian Protestants, fled religious persecution in what is today's Czech Republic. They arrived in Saxony in Germany, where a Christian leader called Count Zinzendorf took them in. Hundreds arrived and eventually settled in a town called Hernhut. But it wasn't long, however, before religious factions divided this small Christian community. But Count Zinzendorf went from door to door, pleading with them to focus on their agreements rather than their differences. And then in a moment on May the 12th, 1727, the Moravian Protestants signed an agreement as a mark of unity and they started a series of prayer meetings. So a few months later in August, something spectacular happened in the midst of one of these prayer meetings. Women and men became even more passionate and committed to prayer and learning more from the Bible. And empowered by what God was doing in their midst, they committed themselves to prayer 24 hours a day. People committing to shifts of prayer at different hours of the day and night. And this 24-hour commitment to prayer by, by a community of only a few hundred Christians continued for over 100 years and sparked what many historians refer to as the modern missions movement. Moments that lead to movements. Moments can change our lives for better or for worse as they lead to movement personally. But moments can also lead to a movement at a macro, far-reaching level as well. What's fascinating about the narrative of the Bible is that when people encounter Jesus, both happen. In the Bible, such movements often, such moments often led to movement in each person's life and even contributed to a greater movement which changed the course of human history. And so over the next six weeks, we're going to be parachuting into different encounters that Jesus had with different people. And we'll learn from the story of their lives how our response to Jesus in key moments create and contributes to movement in us and around us for better or for worse. With that said, if you have access to a Bible, either in paper or electronic form, you might want to get them ready. We're limited by the screens that we have. And so I won't be displaying 
things on, I won't be displaying the passage on a screen. But you can read along if you'd like in your own Bibles. We're going to be at the beginning of John chapter 4, and I'll be reading from the NIV translation. But before we launch into the reading of John 4, I'm going to pray and ask that God might make these words come alive for you and I, wherever we find ourselves watching and listening to them. Let's pray together. Loving God, we give you thanks for this time that we get to share together, connected through technology, but most importantly, connected into community by your spirit. And in this time, we ask you to speak to us where we are and move us towards becoming people that you created us to be. And I'm asking these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. In writing his account of Jesus's life, John, the gospel writer, recorded a number of encounters that Jesus had with a variety of people. And in these encounters, Jesus would either perform something that was a little miraculous or out of the norm, or he would make a claim about himself. And at the end of every encounter, the people involved were left to make a decision for themselves about who they believed Jesus to be. At the end of John's gospel in chapter 20, verse 31, John writes about his hope for people who read his eyewitness account of the life of Jesus by using these words. He writes, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Well, as we're about to read, Jesus often moved towards the unlikeliest of people who brought about some incredible movement in their lives when it dawned on them who Jesus really is. With that said, hopefully you're at John 4, and we're going to read the story in its entirety before I take a few moments to break it down together. Let's read John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Let's read. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. And so he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. And yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. As this story opens up, 
the scene is set for something extraordinary to happen. Jesus has ventured into a region where people are diametrically opposed and at odds to his own Jewish tradition. For hundreds of years, Samaritans and Jews had been engaged in ongoing strife and conflict with both sides committing violent war crimes against the other. But after sending his disciples into town to purchase some food, Jesus finds himself alone in the heat of the day around noon, tired and thirsty. And then this happens. A solitary woman appears on the scene. Verse 7 records like this. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Here comes the first striking feature of this story. It's shocking that in that day and context, Jesus is even initiating a conversation with this lady in the first place. The fact that this woman comes to draw water in the middle of the day on her own gives us a hint that she is an outcast, that she's isolated, even with her own marginalized part of society. And it's most likely due to some moral factors. So this, combined with her ethnicity, her gender, and the societal norms of Jesus' day, mean that this conversation should not be happening. In commenting on how outrageous this scene is, Timothy Keller writes in one of his books, when Jesus begins to speak to her, he is deliberately reaching across every significant barrier that people can put up between themselves. This lady knows it. All of the people who would have first heard this story in John's account would have known it. This conversation shouldn't be happening. But Jesus intentionally initiates a conversation with this woman. And it's not just because he needs a drink of water, although I do. Time and time again, Jesus moves towards the most unlikeliest of people, to initiate a moment with them, which could change everything for them. But don't take my words for it. Look at what Jesus has to say for himself to this Samaritan woman. It's the back half of verse 10. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. While Jesus is speaking metaphorically here with living water referring to what Jesus would later call eternal life, the weight and meaning of it can get lost on us as we sit in our homes with relatively easy access to running water. But if you live in a hot and dry desert climate and getting water requires you to go and to a well to draw it up, then water takes on a whole other value. One commentator says that Jesus is essentially saying something along the lines of, I've got something for you that is as basic and as necessary to you spiritually as water is to you physically. But Jesus's metaphor doesn't stop there. He goes on to describe this living water as something that satisfies us from the inside out. It wells up from within and it brings this deep, soul satisfaction that enables us to be content regardless of what's happening outside of us. One scholar simply describes this water that eliminates thirst and leads to eternal life with these words. He writes, living water is life nourished by God. That sounds a little something like what this world needs a lot of right now, doesn't it? And just as Jesus offers living water to this woman, he offers it to you and I as well. It's a life that's lived in relationship with God, a life that is nourished by God and brings contentment and satisfaction regardless of whether we're footloose and fancy free in life or we're confined to our homes. That's the living water, the eternal life that we can find and experience in Jesus. The problem is that far too often we don't fully comprehend what Jesus is talking about here because we're too preoccupied, too occupied with trying to find satisfaction and contentment in other things. Perhaps it's romance. Maybe it's the pursuit of excellence in a career. Maybe it's centered on a particular political or social cause. Maybe it's financial security or prosperity or comf comfort. And in and of themselves, none of these things are inherently wrong, but they will not provide lasting satisfaction or bring contentment to what our souls ultimately thirst for. On the other hand, sometimes we don't fully comprehend what Jesus is talking about here because of the mistakes that we've made or the consequences of prior decisions. We think that we're in too deep with our dysfunction and wounds and blemishes, that there's no way that Jesus' offer of living water is available to us. 
for whatever reason, this lady in this moment with Jesus completely misses what he's saying. So when she says in verse 15, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She's still looking for something that will satisfy her deepest longings in the wrong places and things. She's still thinking that Jesus is talking about water that is wet, which is what makes Jesus's next words to her so jarring. But ultimately, it's really clarifying. In verse 16, Jesus says, he told her, go call your husband and come back. Now, although it might seem as if Jesus is suddenly changing the subject, he's not. Rather, Jesus is is just giving her a little nudge, revealing to her that before she understands the nature of the living water, she first needs to recognize where she's been looking for contentment and satisfaction in the wrong places. In this instance, it's the five previous marriages that she's had with different men, as well as her current relationship. It's important that we don't think that Jesus is shaming this lady for her, for her history of broken marriages and her current relationship status. God does not shame us for the areas of brokenness and dysfunction in our life, but he may prod into those tender areas of our lives where there is brokenness and dysfunction. And he does this in order to reveal that our pursuits for satisfaction and contentment outside of God will always leave us lacking and wanting more. But in him, we find what our souls most thirst for. This is living water. This is life nourished by God. Jesus's firm but tender conversation with this lady doesn't leave her feeling shamed, but rather in all. And although it still hasn't quite clicked, she recognizes that Jesus is clearly someone well equipped to discuss spiritual matters with. And so she asks Jesus one of the most contentious theological questions of their day. In verse 20, she asks, Our ancestors, they worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place that we must worship is in Jerusalem. And essentially her question is, well, well, who was right? And Jesus responds with some remarkable words that we could spend another 30 minutes unpacking all that they mean. Unfortunately, though, we don't have the time. So I just want to share with you how one Christian leader summarized Jesus' incredible response to this woman. He basically says that Jesus is saying, the time is coming when there will be no need for a physical temple in order to have access to God. And this is a, this is a mind-blowing revelation to the lady. And she can't quite wrap her head around the implications of what Jesus is saying. And so she does what I think a lot of us do when we're confronted with a stunning insight from God. But we're not quite willing to move on it in response just yet. She she puts off responding in the meantime. Her words, well, she just goes, well, you know what? I'll just wait until Messiah, the Christ comes, and then he'll explain it to me. Now, we might not say it like that, but we often use words with a similar intent. I'll wait until Jesus really shows up in my life before I make any movement towards him. I'll respond in obedience to Jesus once I know that he's going to hold up his end of the deal. I'll wait until the timing feels a little more right or convenient before I make my move and respond to Jesus. And while Jesus will always allow us to decide whether we move towards him or not, he does not hesitate in declaring who he is. In, at the end of verse 26, Jesus' words, he says, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus has said a lot of things to this woman in this moment. He says, I'm the one in whom you'll find what your soul most longs for. And he says, I'm the one through whom you can have access to God. And his words leave her with a choice around what her next move will be. Will she recognize Jesus for who he is in her life? Or will she return to her previous normality and continue chasing after things which have not and will not satisfy what her soul thirsts for? That's what Jesus said to her. My question for you, though, is what might he be saying to you in this moment? 
in light of everything that's that's going on in our world and in your life right now, what's Jesus saying to you? As you wrestle with stress, anxiety, fear, uncertainty, or maybe even apathy around what's currently occurring, and there's nothing to be ashamed about having those feelings, what might Jesus be saying to you? In relation to some of the things that you're currently hoping to find satisfaction and contentment in, but they won't quench what you truly thirst for, what might Jesus be saying to you? In relation to how you're feeling in this current pandemic moment, what might Jesus be saying to you? In his invitation for you to experience life with him, what might Jesus be saying to you? Well, what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman continues to be true for you and I here today. Jesus is the one in whom you'll find what your soul most longs for. Jesus is the one through whom you can have access to God. Jesus is the one who John hoped that by reading his account of Jesus' life in chapter 20, verse 31, his hope is that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. What's both inspiring and sobering is that your response and my response in this moment, how we move as a result, won't just influence our lives, but it'll also impact the lives of those around us. If you were to keep reading through John chapter 4, you'll see how this Samaritan woman responds to this moment with Jesus. She leaves her water jar at the well. She goes back into the town and she tells everyone who will listen, I think I found the Messiah. And here's how John records this moment between a Samaritan woman and Jesus becoming a movement that impacts not just her life, but also the lives of those around her. John chapter 4, verse 39 shows, tells us this. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. A moment becomes a movement both personally and publicly, and it even reaches through history to touch your life and mine today. That's what happened in and through the life of this woman. I wonder, though, what could happen in and through my life and yours if we responded in a similar way. Ultimately, I get to choose, you get to choose, we get to choose the move that we'll make next. And so I'm going to close with a little prayer uh, that will hopefully appear on the screen at the end. And then if you'd like, you'll have the opportunity to consider what this might mean for you. And you can do this and maybe share um, a little bit around this reflection question, which will also hopefully pop up on the screen. And this is that question. In this moment, what do I sense Jesus is saying to me? What do I sense Jesus is saying to me about my fears, my stresses, my anxieties and uncertainties? Remember, there's no shame about having those feelings. What do I sense Jesus is saying to me? What do I sense Jesus is saying to me about the things which do not provide the satisfaction and contentment that I'm looking for? What do I sense Jesus is saying to me about what a life nourished by God could look like for me in this season? In this moment, what do you sense Jesus is saying to you? Well, to begin to help you move in response, you might like to pray a little prayer like this. Jesus, I believe that I have life in your name. Help me to experience more of it in this time. This question and this prayer will, will hopefully stay up on the screen at the end of this video. But before we spend some time in prayer and conversation with each other, let me pray for us all as we round out this message. Let's pray together. Loving God, in this time right now, we need to hear what it is that you have to say to us. In the midst of strange and uncertain times, with all the lingering questions and doubts and fears and anxieties that we might have, we ask you to speak to us. We want to declare and make this our prayer. Jesus, I believe that I have life in your name. 
Help me to experience more of it in this time. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. As you split up into your, and potentially have some conversations with each other or pray with each other, I just want to speak over you a blessing that has been spoken out for thousands of years. It's, it's from Numbers and it just says this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious towards you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May this be true in your life and mine today, tomorrow, and in the days to come. Take care and we'll see you next time.